Charlie Knowling from the library. I'm a librarian here at the college archivist. And this is Ian Hout, who did an internship with me this past fall. Did a great job working on some pretty neat old, uh, well, not really videos, old 16 millimeter home movie films that were shot by a campus school student here back in the 1930s. It's very rare, very unique material. Ian did a lot of work with it. He's very familiar with it now. He's got a slideshow together to explain to you some of the context of it, where it came from, what it is, and you will get to see some of this original film. I'll just make a quick pitch while we're showing, or before we show this, that what we're seeing today is four segments of the film. There are others that could be worked on, so if anybody's looking for an inter internship opportunity, independent study, wants to work on old movie stuff, that kind of thing, do see me at some point, and maybe we can set that up so you can have a turn of working on some of this too, because there's other parts. Trips up to the lake, uh, picnics, parades on Main Street, all kinds of things. This part here really is more just for the normal school, the old uh, campus school and so on. But I'm going to turn it over to you now, Ian. Good luck. Before we get too much in the video, uh, Charlie and I thought it'd be great if we explained more of where it's taking place. This was brought forward um, before the first world, Second World War. My apologies. Uh, back when it was known as the Normal School, which was just a state teacher's college, it was a three-year program where you would learn to be a teacher in uh, elementary and middle school. Um, actually, the entire campus sits where Hartwell Hall is now and was just a couple hundred students, a handful of teachers now compared to what we have professors on staff now. And they just came together and have this well here and funded it themselves. Uh, here we have a picture of the <coughs> tell its major differences between Harvard Hall and the normal school now. And according, um, with the normal school, there was also the campus school that they would teach at. This is where they would be student teachers. It was run entirely by the normal school, and families of the village could apply and enroll their children here as students, while the normal school students would work under the tutelage of their professors, so it was all very inclusive and done then. And one of the students that, that attended is the one that shot the film today. His name is Emmett Costage, lived over on College Street. Uh, his dad came over here, worked for Kodak for a little while, and then became a traffic engineer doing traffic lights, road construction, and all that for the D, uh, DO2. It was later donated to us by his sister, but we found out Emmett became a dentist and started teaching in Kentucky, where he lived out the rest of his life. Every May, normal school would have kind of a spring celebration like we do now, but it was one of the then brought before. It was run by the entire it was run by the entire school. The students had to plan what they were doing, make their costumes, construct the seating. They did everything. The teachers did nothing besides make lunch that day. Uh, they the program of the day started at 9 a.m. Uh, they would have an assembly, and the day would just be a whole day of celebration. There were baseball games, tennis matches, the play in the afternoon, and of course the all important dance at that night, which became famous all over the place. High schools in the area would let out that day, even if they weren't associated with Brockport, because the students were going to go anyway and miss the day of school. And as far as Ohio, the Brockport Norman School was known as that place with the color dance. The first footage we have is from 1933, the, the story of that year was The Legend of the Sun Goddess. It's based off of an old Japanese creation map for their chief deity. Uh, here we can see just the rundown of the events that were going to happen that day. dig up some pictures of two important figures that year. We had Dorothea Small, she was the May Queen that year, and Elizabeth Brown, who played Amaterasu, the Sun Goddess. The May Queen was elected every year out of the senior class, and she was just the queen of it. They made a throne and everything. She wore a white dress and a floral wreath, and the two runners-up would be her ladies-in-waiting, and then the 
attendance would be from the junior class. And this was done every year. And it was one of the big traditions. Even in the year they weren't doing an English or European theme, they kept it in here, along with an English country dance in Mexico. This is the story of the sun goddess. It really begins where the action's already taking place, where Amaterasu and her brother Susano have gotten in a fight because she has won a challenge against him. So he steals her necklace, which she is, is so saddened by that she hides in a heavenly rock cave, which deprives the world of light. So Luzume, the goddess of mirth, and all the other gods decide to hang a mirror in front of the cave and throw a party on behind it where Kuzume would start dancing. Interested by what's going on, Amaterasu can't help but look outside but can't see anything besides her light reflected in the mirror. So she's forced to go back outside and return light balanced above heaven and earth. So now we'll be switching to the actual video. It might not be in perfect order, but you will be able to see uh, the arc of the story because the film we got did was all in place. I'll just add too while this is running because it's silent, we're not going to interrupt any sound. This is all taking place, we thought, Ian right at the north end of where Hartwell is now, in between where Hartwell is now, I'm sorry, and the railroad tracks, in that area there, the other side of Alumni House, and that, where that parking lot is. I think that's where we thought a lot of this was taking place. You know? yeah. I think in a couple of shots here, you can, you can catch a glimpse of the train tracks. Now you can see the May Queen back there and throwing a couple of these shots.
Were the younger kids there, are they campus school students, do you figure? They were a campus school figure. The, all the schools, even the ones not associated with the normal school that were in Brockport, got to play a part in this. It just became that big as it went on. Um, in 1935, we're going to see some soldiers marching. They're actually high school students from the Brock, from Brockport. <coughs> There's a shed that appeared about three quarters of the way through. Do you know where that is, or do we really not know the location of where that was? Uh, according to where it is, it should be part of uh, what was then the Dean's School, where um, mm -hmm. Dr. Thompson used to live, and it was part of probably like a little gardening shed or maybe part of this garage. Cool. Yeah. What is alumni house now? Oh. Okay. That used to be the principal's residence. The principals and the presidents lived there until. Dr. Tower in the 1960s, early 1960s, was the last president to live in the house. You don't have questions now. There's going to be time at the end. Um, now, this is really interesting. What we found also in 1933 is Emmett took footage of the lunch that was provided by the teachers at the time. Um, and a lot of these professors at the time are well, the buildings we now go to class in are named after yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Thompson and Charles Cooper. And a lot of the teachers uh, at the time had built them. And then even the ones we've gone by uh, Alice Yale. But recently, um, on the walkway to the library behind the uh, Brown Building, she has a little stone dedicated to her in front of one of the new benches. Uh, and here we have two pictures. There's FSEO on the left. And coming into this project, this is what I really think of as a historical book. I always just see those for them. Textbooks, they're opposed, they're well done up. But this footage really humanizes them. It really shows them just messing around. We got Cooper at the grill. He's got a chef's hat on him. He's a joke. Uh, he thinks that Perry, he goes up to Thompson. Thompson, when he figures out he's being filmed, goes stiff and tries to act professional. But and he just laughs, and it really just shows that people back in history, they were here. <coughs> there's people like us, and they were messing around having a good time on this festival, too. Moving on to the 1934 color day. This one was titled The Folklore of Spring. Uh, 
the theme this year, kind of, they took the traditions from old European countries such as Italy, Germany, and Russia, and they performed different traditions from those countries. Most of them, um, including dances, this is the first year we see the appearance of the always popular Maypole during the uh, English sec section. But really, they took the traditions of each country. Like with Ireland, they have the old marigold woman, which is uh, a tradition where a woman will spread marigold petals on the ground in the middle of the night. And when you walk out to your fields the next morning, you step on it. It's supposed to bring good luck with butter and milk and uh, all your agriculture. And you see different cultures cultures and different dances, such as in the Russian section, and I had to write this down because the title is really long, the Kara Marinskia dance. You'll see that it's a, just a two-person two dance, it's a couple. You'll see them come up. And the May Queen that year was Audrey Southwood. Should have asked that to administration, but any questions? Sorry. Why were some of the women wearing white? It looked like women were two different kinds of dress there. I was wondering what that was about. Uh, it's all about the characters and the countries they were, and a lot of times it wouldn't even be different characters. It was just such a big thing. It's like they had such a large cast. I know, uh, with the black dresses, those were from the Ireland section. There's Dances of the Witch in the Wood, or I believe that's the title, and, and the little kids running around, those are little fairies, and they all had different 
roles to play and really the cast was large enough where everyone had a role and they never had to play two characters. The last year we have footage uh, for today is from the 1935 color day, which they did in the fashion of Rip Van Winkle. That's right, sorry. And uh, again, Charlie really snuck this one out. He found one of the programs of the year all signed by everyone and found out who it belonged to, which was Barbara Dobson. See all her friends signed. And, uh, of course, we all know the story for Van Winkle, Dutch man living in New York, goes out hunting one day. He runs into some strange folk up on the mountain, and they convince him to play a game with them and share an egg of wine, which leads to his long sleep. Waking up, he has found that he had become an old man, and history around him has changed. Also twice in this play, you'll see there's two short stories played out, so the, some of the younger students can be involved. It's when Rip is telling uh, stories to the village children. The first story is The Choice of Sacred Wind, which is uh, Native American based where a chief is trying to find the husband for his daughter, Sacred Wind, and he holds a competition. And it's mainly down between another tribe who sends representative, and he's big and strong, and um, really shows off what is not they're looking for. And then they're inside their own tribe, they have a more meek, but equally capable person who uses his head and like his muscles. And then the second one, Snow White, we all, we all know with the witch and actually in Snow White, we'll get to see Emmett's older sister, Phyllis, playing the queen.
that concludes the footage we have of Color Day, not the administration. But as Charlie stated at the beginning, there's there's about 20 more minutes or so of video of other things not happening really at the school, but just around the area in town, all the way from uh, the National Recovery Administration parades to the more what we think of home videos of uh, Fifi's birthday, which I believe is Phyllis, but we never got a clear answer on that. And just a lot of interesting things to look at in these videos. So, any final questions? This is a comment that Alexander Catioto, who showed there, then became our first graduate student, first person to get a master's in prop work after the war. And his roommate was Dick Tanning, who founded one of the first uh, chains of health clubs. Uh, Cordy Caniotto, McKenney tried to get him to come to California with him. He thought, nah, that'll never work. But Dick <laughs> <laughs> Caniotto was a household word but when I was growing up. So as I was in the background, do you know what street those would be on and if they're still standing today? Uh, they, what? Really where the normal school was is where Harwell was today, so everything in front of that is in this relatively same area, although some of the houses might have fallen down, then refurbished, so parts of them might be around. I think some of them were maybe on Utica, some on Monroe, but the other thing that's confusing, I think, for people now is that, you know where Alumni House is, right? There were several other houses on the property in that same area, on the same side as Hartwell, that were later torn down after World War II. So I think some of the houses you're seeing, they were filming a lot, a lot of this was being staged at that end of the campus towards the railroad tracks. And as he was filming, I think he was, some of these are glimpses of houses that no longer exist, that used to be right sort of in a line with Alumni House. There were two houses uh, past Alumni House and then along Monroe, there were a couple of houses that were on what is now the college property. One of them had even been a German Lutheran church back in the 1800s. So there are other buildings there that no longer exist. It was all residential around there. On Kenyon Street, that was all houses and so on. All the school was was that it was a one building school, basically, that old normal school complex. And then they tore that down in the late 30s and replaced it with what we now call Parkwell Hall, but to them it was just the building that was the whole thing. But that's where it all was, was right around there. So I think some of those houses are still there, but like Ian saying, they may look a little different today, but it was all filmed right on the campus. I was curious. It was Hartwell that canceled the day. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that. Well, when did it start, Color Day, and then was like that? Yeah. is when the first one was, and then it only lasted till 37, because Harwell came in after Thompson and said, this is too rowdy. This is too rowdy. <laughs> Front four hasn't changed. Do the plays, um, you seem to know quite a bit about them. Were there any speaking parts in these plays? Or? Uh, yes. I, they I, mean, I couldn't tell whether their mouths were moving or not. Uh, no, the characters, they had to learn their lines. Oh, so they must. Yes. I mean, I know it's a sign of yeah. I get that. <laughs> but I couldn't tell whether they were just because, of, you know, they're outside and couldn't people hear them, and whether they were just quiet or, you know, very little speaking. Uh, no, they, I mean, being outside, I just imagine they have to project very yeah. well. Okay. But there were even some songs. Yeah, there were some songs. And Obviously, they can sing, yes. And the other question I had is, is did people uh, move to the area as the when it first started, or was it just the academic film? I mean, that's all they were doing. Was um, as I remember, there, there were some dorms, but a lot of the, uh, the students at the time were local, so they would come in and just, they were from the town or from like the next village over. Spencer so when it was one building, it probably was not, there probably wasn't any. It, it was mainly, mainly academic. <clears throat> there, was no, there were no students living in that building that you saw. It was purely for academic purposes. People either lived at their own home and then walked or whatever, or they roomed in houses in the village that you know, were spon not sponsored, but 
approved by the college, uh, by the normal school. And there were people who even commuted in uh, by car or by trolley in the old days. But no, there were no dorms at that point. They weren't built until after, the first dorms weren't built at, until after World War II, when everything just started to really expand tremendously. I think uh, there'd been a fire at Fredonia that killed some students yes. around 1900. The regions banned right. dorms after that. Yeah, it, there's, it's sort of that would be an interesting history to do. Is where did they where did they sleep? And, and in the really old days, in the 19th century, students did room in the building with some of the faculty, and they all lived together. And then in the 1850s, there was a fire in the school, part of which was attributed to somebody cooking taffy in their room or something. They set the school on fire, they had to rebuild it. But then later, around 1900, as, as Bruce is touching on, there was a tragic fire at Fredonia in the building there, and I think one or two students died as a result, so they banned living in the buildings at all the normal schools in New York. And at that point, they went into a model where people just commuted in, either from rooms they rented in the village or from their own you know, family homes, et cetera. And it wasn't until after World War II that we started to have separate dormitory buildings here in Rockport. The first one was a frame building they built over by where Seymour is today in Rayclough. They called it West Hall and it was for women. That was in the late 40s. So uh, I'm assuming that the names of the individuals is something you folks added later on, or were they actually in the video you had? Uh, no, when, when Charlie first got the films, he got actual film in the can, uh, in cans. But when I came to the project, it had all been digitized. It was actually my project in the internship to cut the film into the years, figure out what pieces went where, and I had the captions of who, who was in the film. Yeah, that's a great question, Bob. That's a lot of what Ian did on this project, was there's two cans of film that uh, Emmett Costin shot over a period of some years, probably six or seven years in the 30s. And it's just all these sort of random segments. You know, he'd shoot a little bit, and that would be five minutes here, ten minutes there, that kind of thing. So Ian, once we had it digitized, and then you helped with that, and that's what Ian spent a lot of time doing, was going through and figuring out which bit was which, and which color did was this one, and which one was that, and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of detective work for Ian using the old college yearbooks, the student newspaper, programs for color day. I used to check on him once in a while just to make sure he was <laughs> still doing okay there, sitting at the computer hour after hour, doing a great job. I actually had some really early toy film from when Emma was in high school. It was his uh, senior picnic. They went up to the beach. It was really, really early. It's a kind of set of material where there's a lot of interesting connections. What uh, Ian's referring to right now is there's a section of colored film, the senior, the senior picnic up at Hamlin Beach in 1938 or 9. And I shared some of that with a woman who's a member of the Hamlin Beach Friends group. They're very interested by that because that's just around the time it was being made into a park from the Triple C, the Civilian Conservation Corps facility it had been. And then it, took a break during World War II. They used it to house prisoners of war. They had German and Italian prisoners up there. And then after the war, it went on to become the part that many are probably familiar with here. But that's some of the earliest film footage, I, I think, that, that exists of that park up there and of the beach and so on. So there's a lot of interesting material there. Uh, I think Ian certainly, he obviously found a lot to work with, but there's, there's more that could be done. So if anybody's interested in that kind of a project, I'd be happy to talk about it. What does the process look like taking film and turning it into a digital form? How does that happen? Well, I didn't take care of that process. Yeah, basically you need to be able to play it back on something. And especially with older film, when there's other issues, I mean the film itself may be fragile. So you have to be really careful with it. But essentially you take film, which is an analog form, so you need some means to, to play it back and capture it. Uh, newer things, we can take something like a VCR, which is they still exist, and it's hard to believe. But you can plug a VCR right into a computer now. So we're getting to the point where things is like VHS tapes, we can take right into a computer. You can you can take an analog feed into the computer, actually play it back and just capture it in a digital format. Some of these things you literally have to play back on a screen, and then you're videoing it with a digital camera on the screen. That's one of the safest ways to do it. Um, they're getting a little more sophisticated where you can project into the camera. 
and, and capture it that way. They'll get a little higher quality capture, but one of the biggest issues really is assessing what the original condition of the film is to start with because some of the stuff's been sitting on, well, somebody's attic and the heat cold, heat cold, and you know, it, it's not really that resilient. It gets moisturized, so um, half the project right away is just making sure you can actually mm -hmm. play it without having it shred in your hands. You know. It's an interesting question, too, because it, it touches on part of the challenge for archives people that you may have the medium, the film, but the equipment isn't necessarily around anymore. When I started here in 1990, we had a whole facility over in Edwards, all kinds of 16 millimeter projectors. When I got this film originally from Emmett's sister, like Bob was saying, it was old, it was kind of brittle. I brought it over there, and Richie Hart, who was an AV tech then, they had a whole machine that you could run 16 millimeter film through it. It kind of fed it through, not like a bath, but it oiled it as it went through. It lubricated it, cleaned it up. They had all this equipment to do this kind of thing, but that's all gone. There's only one 16 millimeter projector on campus on that. That's in the archives. They just brought it over for me to look at, to look at some of these films so that I could try and see what some of some other things were that I had. The audio doesn't work on that projector, but downtown at the Visual Studies Workshop, they have a 16 millimeter projector that's one of ours actually that we let them borrow. And that one does have some sort of a hookup so you can run 16 millimeter film on it and then it converts it into a digital form and, you can, and puts it on a hard drive for you. And we're going to try and team up with them See if I can send some of the stuff down and I'll digitize from the original 16 millimeter film. But it's it's a challenging thing. You have a lot of materials maybe that exist like 16 millimeter film, but sometimes the real trick is, is to find equipment to run it on or to display it on project it. It's quite a challenge sometimes. Very interesting challenge. Any other questions, comments? Well, I'm interested in any of this stuff, or even if you're not doing an internship, Charlie loves to show off his collection. <laughs> so if you have any questions, don't say anything. I get lonely in there, so stop by. <laughs> Just don't touch anything. <laughs> what did you get most out of your experience? Uh, well, I got a lot of the technical, the technical work. I walked into this project not even knowing how to use a movie maker. Uh, <laughs> So it was kind of just learning as I go, but as I go, I'm not from the area, I'm from the Thousand Islands, but through my research, I got to learn a lot about the college I spent four years at, really knew nothing about. I got to learn about some people here who the buildings were named after, so I got to learn some really interesting things and use some techniques. Okay. Okay, well thank you all for coming.